And today we have a very distinguished speaker, our uh, second keynote speaker. Let me introduce you, Christian Rajrate. I was working on his last name. I hope I'm doing well. Uh, he is the Chief Technology Officer for HP's Cloud Strategy Team Worldwide. One of his responsibilities is coordination of cloud activities across HP. And prior to his current position, he was responsible for top leadership and innovation and scanning industry and technology trends. He has been working for HP for a long time and from his first HP job as a systems engineer through project, regional, district, and global management, Rashtrate has concentrated on developing, marketing, and advancing infrastructure services. <coughs> he is the author of numerous publications, numerous books and articles, and he runs HP's manufacturing distribution block. He is member of the board of the Supply Chain Council, and he holds a mechanical engineering degree as well as a degree in industrial management. Both degrees are from Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. And he is actually based in Brussels, Belgium. Now, uh, now I will leave the floor to Christian. Christian. Thank you, Sarah. Let, <laughs> let me just start. There is one, one marvelous feature on these devices, which is when you shut them down, they actually stop. So uh, that's, what, that's, that, that's what happened, but don't worry about that. Um, I'm really glad to be in Limerick, quite frankly, when I agreed uh, to speak here today a couple, uh, couple of months ago. I didn't realize where Limerick was. Um, it took me quite a while to get here yesterday, so unfortunately I couldn't join you for the, uh, um, for the, um, the reception last night. I came in too late for that. Um, but I'm really glad to be here. And what I want to talk to you about is how cloud computing can really help us and is, is really going to change the way our life is going to be run and what we're actually going to do. And how by that it gives us immense opportunities on the one hand to really be able to do new things and to do existing things differently. I often use this example, and maybe it's because I'm a little bit older that I think about that, but what would you think about walking on the streets in whatever town around the globe and, thank you, and suddenly having an ambulance coming near you with a guy with a white coat coming down saying, Dear Mr. Estrada, could you please come and join us in the ambulance because we spotted that in quarter of an hour you're going to do a heart infarct and we want to avoid that. What do you think? You're going to say, hey, I'm young, I'm exercising, I don't care about that. That's right. But that are possibilities that become available. Like Sarah said, I've been in the IT industry for a little while. I did my first thesis with punched cards on an IBM mainframe. That dates me. My second one, I was much further. I was on Xerox mini computer with punched tape instead of punched cards. It was still holes in carton and paper. Today, like all of us, I carry one of these devices with me and I'm expected to answer within the next five minutes every time that I actually get something. The world has evolved, and the world has evolved in a set of waves. We've gone through the mainframe wave. We've then gone to something that people called client-server. We've then gone through the internet. Web 1.0, Web 2.0, now people argue about Web 3.0, 4.0, 5.0, whatever the numbers is. I don't think that's important. What's really key is this combination of things that we're going to, and that for lack of a better term, I labeled here the combination of mobile, social, big data, and clouds. Aberdeen Group calls it SOMO-CLO. I don't know whether you like that name. 
I hate it, quite frankly, because I don't think, first of all, it's unpronounceable, and secondly, I don't think it means anything. But there is something out there that is actually allowing us to go through new things. Now, all the elements that are here are not equivalent. Social and big data are really about information and the capability of using and exploiting information. Mobile is about how that information reach you, the consumer of the information. And cloud is really around the environment that make it all happen. But if you start pulling the pieces together, you really get to a place where you can start doing new things. You can start building new customer relationships. You can start setting up new business models. You can do new products and service combinations. You can get new go-to-market approaches, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now, I don't want to stay into theory, so I'm going to give you a lot of examples. But before doing that, what is this changing? Well, up till now, as an individual, as an enterprise, to be able to exploit <coughs> IT in one way, form, or fashion, you needed a quote-unquote data center. Could be as small as a couple PCs or a couple servers in a cupboard, could be a couple square miles or a couple square kilometers if you're really, really big. In any dimensions, it's all about that. And so the focus of some people in your organization is around that infrastructure. That's now moving away. That's moving away because there is this feeling that somewhere in the universe there is this unlimited capacity of IT capabilities that I can tap into. Now we all know it's not unlimited because everything is limited in the world, but it's limited to such a large extent that it sounds like unlimited to us. That's one piece. And then the other piece of the equation that is sort of creeping into everything we do is this whole concept of paper use. Paper use is not specific to IT. Today, in Brussels, and I'm pretty sure in many other countries, if I wish, I can take a bike or a car in a paper use mode. I was talking to the people from Rolls-Royce the other day, the, en the airplane engine maker, and what I didn't realize is today most airlines don't buy airplane, they don't buy engines anymore. They pay per use. Did you know that? Very interesting. So that concept is not just specific to IT, but it's also used in IT. And the second element that's happened is that time is shrinking. When I joined HP, we had a wonderful system that allowed us to get a response from our West Coast business units in three working days. Over the break, I can explain you how it works, how it worked. It was unmatched. Our customers were absolutely flabbergasted. Today, if my respondent hasn't responded in 10 minutes, I'm getting nervous. Time is shrinking. So we are expected to be on the ball much faster. But the world at the same time is becoming more global and more complex. So we need to be able to receive, digest, sequence, an ever larger amount of information for us to be able to take the decision that we will have to feed back faster and faster. That's where that combination of mobile, cloud, big data, and social is really going to help us. What are enterprises looking for today? We've gone over the last 10 years 
And for the ones amongst you that are in the business world, you probably realize that we've gone through an in ever-increasing cost reduction scheme, <coughs> reducing costs. And we've sort of reduced costs in many companies to the bare bone. <coughs> now we need to get to something else. And people are back into a mood of more innovation. But to be able to innovate, they want the enterprise to be more agile, they want the enterprise to be more responsive, to react faster to opportunities, being them geographic, being them new areas where they can do business, being something else. But the CFOs are out there to make absolutely sure that this happens without extra costs. Now to be able to do that, what they really need is understanding their markets, understanding their customers much better. At the same time, all of our end users, who up till 10 years ago were completely IT illiterate, now, well, they Facebook and they tweet and they blog and they do all of those things, and they're expecting and they're getting a heck of a lot of things free in these, on, their, on the top of their fingertips. Why can't they get the same from their IT department? So what they want is they want to be always connected. They want to have the information at their fingertips. They want to increase the IT flexibility. They want to increase flexibility so that they can get what they want when they want it. And obviously all of that needs to happen at a reduced cost. That leads to innovation. Now innovation is a real interesting topic. But to bring it down to earth, where can I innovate? I believe that there's four key places where you can really start innovation if you're in an enterprise. You can innovate in your business, being it building new business models, being improved and changing business processes, creating efficiencies, working at the business, at the process level. And don't worry, I'll give you some examples of people that have done that. You can work more and more at the combination of products and services. Think about the arrivals of smart TVs. Yesterday, Google, um, Google, Samsung announced a smart watch. I have no clue what purpose it serves, but they announced a smart watch. Now you're going to be able to respond to your email by talking to your watch rather than picking your mobile phone. So you'll do it in three and a half seconds rather than five. Fine. Okay. I can get that. What's the added value? I'm not sure, but that's a different debate altogether. But these are new combinations that are actually coming up. Enterprises move away from just working within the boundaries of their companies to really look at their whole ecosystem. If you're in the manufacturing, and sorry, that's where I'm coming from, so that's the best examples I have, you start dealing with your supply chain partners to really create an integrated supply chain that has a much better understanding of where things stand. You may want to interact with your customers on a much more consistent basis. And last but not least, you may want to change from an IT perspective. We spend a lot of time in focusing on what Jeffrey Moore calls the systems of records, the basic systems you need to run your enterprise. Today is a time for the system of engagements, the systems that allow you to operate, to collaborate, to be able to do things faster and better as a group of people that want to work together. All of those underlay or are fueled by technology innovation. I'm not an advocate of using technology for the sake of using technology. Some are, but that's not me. Technology is there to help you achieve your business better, to help you create those new products, uh, service cons uh, 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 service elements, and so on, and so on, and so on. 
And clouds, mobility, social and big data are really part of those technologies that are actually going to help us moving forward. So enough about theory. Let me give you a bunch of examples. A real interesting example happened about two and a half years ago where Fiat Brazil was asked to create a new concept car. A concept car for an emerging market. And I had the chance to talk to the guy who actually set up this whole thing. And he said, before we started, we expected that the Brazilians will want a large, you know, big car so they could get their big ego into that big car. You see what I'm talking about. But they decided that rather than just doing what they thought the Brazilians wanted, to basically ask them. So they set up an IT portal. They did something which is called crowdsourcing. They asked people to help, to critique, to give ideas on that concept car. And they ended up with about more than 17,000 participants really on a day-to-day -day basis through that portal participating with the designers to create the car. And what did they come up with? With something that looked like this. A very small, very efficient car that could get through the traffic, the horrendous traffic of Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and a couple other countries out there. No, sorry, cover out cities out there. Sorry. What was unique was the way they interacted with their potential customers. You know what the only critic was from their potential customers? That the car actually never got built and sold. Because what happened in the same process, they got IDs from 17,000 people, which gave they got some great IDs, but they also got 17,000 customers. Because if you've been participating in building that, hey, you want one, isn't it? So they could have taken it one step further, but that was not the objective, so it didn't happen, unfortunately. This project is called the Fiat Mio. This is a lot that has been written about it, but it's really interesting to see how technologies and how approaches that are very much our social media type approaches can actually help us achieve new things, do new things. This one I even like better. This is a young guy in the US who created, he was, you know, he created, an, he created a, a, a little product that you to use with the iPhone. And he went through the whole hassle to, you know, to take the patents and to do all of those things and to find somebody to manufacture it and so on and so on and so on. And his product became successful and he sold it off and he sold the whole thing off to somebody and he made quite some money. And then he turned around and said, Oli, mm, now I need to create something else. And so he started tossing with ideas on what he could do. And finally he said, no, that's not what I'm going to do. It was very hard to get this product from ID to market. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a company that's helping people getting products from ID to market. So what did he do? He set up a website, same thing. It's called quirky.com, you can check it. And he proposed anybody that had any ID anywhere around the world to come up with his ID and to describe his ID. His IP remains his, but describe the ID. And then he asks his panel, which is basically the world, which are the best IDs. And so IDs are bubbling up through a process that is called ideation. And the top ID, every week, they take the top ID, they have a couple designers that are going to work with the guy that came up with the ID. They're going to transform the ID in an actual product. They're going to file the patents. They're going to find where and who can manufacture it. And over the couple of years, they've been now in the, in the business, for, I've been following them for about three years, they've built a distribution network to distribute the product. And the whole thing is, the inventor of the ID 
shares the revenue with the company. So they have created a company to do business process innovation. They create a new business process taking advantage of new technologies to do something new. Interesting, isn't it? This is the process that they've actually put in place and you can, on the website, you can find some of the products. <laughs> For example, one product which is really simple that makes a heck of a lot of money was invented by, an, by a, a, a guy out of Norway. You know these strips that we all have to put electricity? And I'm pretty sure you've been in the situation where you put one thing on, you know, a charger, and then the charger sits halfway to the next plug so you can't use the plug. Well, the Norwegian guy said, why don't we make men that just can sort of move around? Simple, isn't it? Well, he brought that in. Everybody said, that's a great idea. They created it, and they both made a ton of money out of it. Okay? So, <laughs> these don't need to be difficult. It's a way to really start moving forward. And let me end up with a third one. This is, I have a little story around this one. I was one day on a train uh, up, all the way up to Amsterdam. And I'm sitting, in, I'm sitting in the train, and I'm reading some things on cloud computing. Well, that's what I'm supposed to do, isn't it? <laughs> and there's a young guy sitting near to me, and he said, oh, sir. He says, are you in cloud computing? I said, yeah. He said, me too. I'm working on cloud computing. He said, ah, okay, great. What are you doing? He said, well, I'm working for a GPS company. Ah, yeah, okay. He said, and GPS company, cloud computing? Explain me. I, I, I don't see the link. He says, well, he says, our GPS company is quite successful. Ah, uh -huh. yeah, and that's an issue. Success, issue. Sorry, I don't get it. He says, well, the problem is following. You're driving along the roads. In front of you, there is a traffic jam. Your GPS gets a signal that there is a traffic jam. Yeah. And calculates an alternate route. Yeah. The problem is all of our GPSs use the same algorithm. So they calculate the same alternate route, so everybody takes the alternate route and you get a, tra a GPS enabled traffic jam. Holy, mm. I haven't thought about that one. He says, so now what we're trying to do, you remember my concept of product service combination? What we're now trying to do is to understand where the, where the different GPSs are suck all of that information back into the cloud and cal calculate from a cloud perspective according to how many there are and the situation around the thing, alternate routes so that different people can take different routes and feed that back to the different GPSs. Okay. Way to use cloud computing to really start improving the customer experience. Isn't that great? So next time you'll, you'll take your GPS, you'll think about the GPS-enabled traffic jam. I'm pretty sure about that one. Okay? But that is just plain vanilla examples. The world is actually going one step further. And you will hear more and more about something which is called the Internet of Things. Today, and in everything that, that I've talked to you about, there's always in one way, form, or shape a human interaction. But our sensors are becoming more and more intelligent. And we're getting more and more of them. So whereas today, these are some of the statistics of what uh, is actually happening every minute in the world. And the one statistic that I love most is that apparently every minute in the world, we shoot 208,333 angry birds. OK? Around the globe, obviously. Um, <laughs> and one guy that I've known who is now the marketing manager from the company that actually sells Angry Birds would be very, very happy with that. Now, that's not really something that adds us a lot of value. But where we're going is we're going to a tremendous amount of devices that will be able to feed back information. And I started by talking about the importance of using that information to be able to make decisions. The Internet of Things is all about that. It's about pervasive connectivity. It's about the use of smart devices. And it's about the better uh, usage of the, in, the explosion of information that is actually becoming available to us. So where can that help? 
And where do we use these devices? And I put a number of examples here together. We do it, we track wildlife. Do I really understand what's happening with our global warming? We have security and access things, and I'll give you an example in that area. Geophysics mapping, infrastructures, um, traffic control. Do you realize that um, when, a f when a plane flies for a couple hours, he generates something like 500 gigabytes worth of information that is actually being preceded and being used to understand when the plane needs to be uh, maintained and all sorts of things like that? That's just the start. It's examples of where the use of sensors, the acquisition of that real-time information really gives us the capability to take decisions, to understand in detail what is actually happening. So let me give you an example. About a year and a half ago, I started talking to a company that is doing surveillance cameras. You know them. They're all over the place. What I didn't realize is that in this world that is ever more becoming digital, 90% of the surveillance cameras are still analog, believe me or not. And they're analog, and they feed into those tapes, you know? You remember those tapes? They feed into those tapes that are actually keeping the last two, three, four hours worth of information and are then wiped out. Not very efficient. So the idea we came up with was to say, well, hang on a minute. What if we digitize that information? Then at least we can store it in digital format. That was the first step. And then we said, well, hang on a minute. If we digitize that information, would there be a way that we could actually start analyzing that information. And it just happens to be that there are a couple of companies around the world that are able to analyze video information for strange things. <coughs> but it needs to be digital. They started doing that for the military, and now this is becoming more available. So I can analyze the information. I can see something strange is happening. And then I have a decision point to do. What do I do with it? Do I warn the owner where he is and feed him back what's actually happening? So that he can decide whether he wants to intervene, call the police, or do whatever needs to be done. This is a completely different experience. Because in the traditional world, what happens, well, something happens, there's a robbery, for example, the only thing you can do is you can take the, uh, the, the cartridge out, you know, you, the, this tape out, bring the tape to the police and hope that they can see something. If you probably eight, eight hours later or whatever. Here, you're getting into real time. You're getting close to what is actually happening. You can take the appropriate decisions because you've started combining the different technologies that I've actually talked about. You may know, or you may remember, that in the U.S. a couple bridges collapsed you know, that over the last couple of years. A lot of our infrastructure is old. We built it after the Second World War, from a lot of it. So we don't really know how well it is. Can we equip our infrastructure with sensors that can actually figure out, before something happens, that things aren't what they should be. And we all know that events don't happen at once. There are some signals. The problem is, most of the time, we don't take care of the signals. This allows us to actually understand that. Understand the signals, and again, make the decision that actually needs to be made. Now, this brings me to another personal example. About three or four years ago, I got, got in touch together with some of my colleagues with Shell. Because Shell had, an ex had a problem. And the problem Shell had was that 
the pumps in refineries occasionally fail. And it's enough for one pump in a refinery to fail, or for a couple of them to fail, and you stop the whole refinery. And we all know we don't have too much refinery capacity around the globe at the moment. So they were looking at ways to actually predict when a, a pump was going to give up. Because today what they do is, after the pump has been used a, number, a given number of years, or, or months, or hours, whatever, they actually take the pump and replace it at the next uh, preventive maintenance. That's not the most efficient use, because some of those pumps can still go on for a couple of years. But you want to know when they're going to give up. And so we looked at the little device that we had created, which is a 3D accelerometer that is extremely precise, to actually look at the vibrations. And so we took the whole Shell team to our labs in Palo Alto, where that device had been created, to actually go and discuss that project. And one of the guys that was there was the chief technology officer from the company. And as soon as he heard what the device could do, he stopped. And he said, no, we're not going to do that thing of the pumps. We're going to do something completely different. But I want to work with you guys. And ever since, we've actually been working together. What have we done? Well, the area he wanted to look at was seismic exploration. Now, do you know how you find oil in the ground? It's actually a pretty primitive way. What you do is you put a bunch of sensors around the place. You then come in with a big truck, like the one that's at the top there, you know, Vibrosis truck. And the truck for about 15 minutes says boom, 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 boom. And you listen to the return of those vibrations. And depending on those returns, where they are, you can actually understand the structure of the underground. And that gives you a vision of how, how the oil, or of whether there is a possibility of oil being there. The problem is the devices that they use are about this size. They're called optophones, if I remember right. They're about this size. They cost $3,000 a piece. So at the maximum, they can put about 100,000 of them. And by the way, they need to cable them. So think about 100,000 devices on a 10 square kilometer with cables. Think about the time it takes to set it up, the time it takes to take it down, the weight, and so on, and so on, and so on. Okay? And because you can only put 100,000, you have a certain visibility because you only measure, I think it's about every 10 meters or something like that. What he wanted to do was use that sensor, embed that sensor in a device, plug it into the ground, but put one every meter. So instead of putting 100,000, put a million of them. Now, when you put a million, forget about cables, okay? So you need to go wireless. Uh, well, if you go wireless, what do I do with energy? What do I do with data transmission? And so on, and so on, and so on. So we had together to reinvent a complete new way of doing a whole bunch of stuff to actually be able to do this. By the way, we've done it. And we start seeing the first results. It's taken us about three years to get there and to go and walk through all of the different pieces. So what basically happens is you have these little, little things. You know, it's about this size, about this large. On top of it, you have a, uh, a solar panel so that you can recreate and add energy to the batteries because they're going to stay in place for about a week. You have a little antenna because we're going to transmit some data, but only some. Because to really measure well, you need to measure at 500 hertz. Every experiment takes about 15 minutes. And the device measures 24 bits. So do the calculation, you get a total of a couple petabytes worth of data. Now, you just don't transfer two petabytes of data over wireless. There's no way you can do it today with the current technologies. So you need to transfer sample data, have a first level of visibility, and then when you, when you take all the devices back after a week and after you've run 10, 20, 10, 20 tests, what you basically do is you put the device in a holder where it will recharge the batteries, and at the same time it will suck the data out. Second thing, how do I know which device is where? Well, the advantage the sensor has is that in 24 hours, 
because of its sensitivity, feeling the changes in traction of moon and sun, it can tell you very precisely where it is. It's quite interesting. Okay? So that's part of how you use some of those technologies to really be able to start doing new things. Now, we're very early days in all of this, but this is where we're going, and this is probably where we will be by the year 2020. But it's a whole ecosystem that is actually being built up, because now I'm going to get these zillions of devices all over the place. And each and every one of the, those devices will give their information, or their data, I should say. Now that data may or may not be used, and may or may not be interesting as a piece of raw information. In some situations, yes. In other situations, you want it to be aggregated with other pieces of information. So what you start seeing is you start seeing this whole environment of that data pulling up and through a very wide net of interrelated technologies, interrelated environments, interrelated infrastructures, using cloud computing basically gets you the ultimate level of information that you actually want. If you look at the weather, you're not interested in just the temperature just now, you're interested in the complete picture. What's the temperature, what's this, what's that, what's that? It's a combination of multiple elements. And then that combination together creates you a base of what is being called, for lack of a better term, big data, that I can now go and analyze to really give me what I'm really looking for. And I can eventually combine that with information that comes with the latest feeds from, uh, from Irish TV or from the BBC or from CNN, I can combine that with information from anywhere to give me the type of information that I may need at any given moment in time to do my job. About six months ago, I, I, I wrote down this, this example. I need to go to a customer. I'm arriving in the parking lot. My agenda is up to date, so my system knows which customer I'm actually going to meet. When I, get off, when I get out of my car, it flashes me on my screen. First of all, don't forget the guy you're meeting just got his birthday yesterday. Uh, by the way, he, he also got his third child. He has been tweeting, and a couple of his tweets were rather negative about your company for this and this and this reason. Um, by the way, he had placed an order six months ago, uh, or three months ago. This is the status of the order. Oh, they got an IT problem yesterday. Uh, this is the latest status. It's just been resolved. Da -da 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 -da. So now I come in and say, hello, sir. How are you doing? By the way, sorry I'm a day late, but happy birthday. And how is your youngest child going? Oh, I heard you were not really happy about what we're doing. Tell me, what can I do? Wow! I've changed the complete interaction with my customer. Why? Because I got a little robot that actually gave me all the information I needed to know right at the time I needed that information. You remember? Anywhere, any place, any time. Let me give you another example. Oh, first, the creation and curation of exabytes of data from a trillion sensors will be drivers for a complete evolution of our structures, of our infrastructures. We're going to need to change a bunch of things, which is good news, because again, this will allow us to do more things and to do things differently. One of the things we're going to need to change is our vocabulary. We all know about megabytes. We all know about gigabytes. Some of us know about terabytes. Some may know about petabytes. I don't know whether you know about any of the others. I've, this, at least you're going to get one thing from me today, is you're going to get the latest terminology. 
with one point is that they still haven't agreed whether the gigabyte is going to be a gigabyte or geobyte or a geobyte or whatever something like that they're still debating about that one but think about it. this becomes inimaginable inimaginable as quantity of information you don't want to have to zift through every single byte and every single information of this you want to get the aggregates you want to get the aggregates to take the decisions so the technologies are there it's tying them together it's delivering what you really need to create that digital experience that is actually becoming ours a couple of months ago I talked to a CIO of a company a UK company that is actually selling building materials they are selling toilets they're selling uh, bathrooms but they're also selling bricks mortar sand all of those things not the most exciting and the most innovative company isn't it well they bought a couple of years ago a US online reseller of the same type of things I didn't know that was existing but apparently it is and they're looking at how to change the experience of the end user of the customer because they realize that their customers are increasingly interacting with them through a variety of different means they may go to their website and start looking at things they may go to the showroom they may call up the, the, help, the, the call center they may go and visit one of the sites where they actually do the selling in every one of those they're going to leave behind a certain imprint but because of the fact all of these are very different nobody actually pulls the pieces together so is there a way that I can pull all of the different elements together and create what is starting to get known as a jargon in the market the digital persona of somebody and then use that to engage to give the person precisely what he or she wants now this becomes a very interesting element because there is an aspect of that which is data gathering there's also an aspect of that which is much more related to the law to privacy and to a number of other elements so how do I balance these two how do I balance the fact that I want to give people the best experience with making sure that I keep the privacy that all of us are eligible to understand the meaning of things understand what people mean what they want to do where they want to go is really important because that allows you to attract people that allows you to better engage with people but again it's collecting data from all sources it's analyzing the data understanding that data and by the way probably 80 95 percent of that data is unstructured which makes it a little, even a little bit more difficult mechanisms and tools exist today the point is pulling them together to achieve the environment and the ecosystems that we want let me sort of finish off my presentation with giving you a little illustrative example it happens to be that I travel quite a lot so this is one that relates to me but I'm pretty sure it's going to relate to many of you too you know you're sitting on the plane you're looking at a film okay and and it's one of my friends who originally created this and he decided that it was going to be Jean, uh, uh, film from, um, from a, a book from Marcel Pagnol but doesn't matter and then you get this ah moment okay you're three quarters down the film you're really into it and now the film freezes and you get this message we are 20 minutes before landing and we will shut down the AV system holy mm, okay I'm not gonna say more I want to see the rest of the film today make sure you get back on the same airlines 
make sure you do it fast enough that the film is still on the list. Remember the moment in which you were so that you can sort of fast forward. In some cases you can, in other cases you can't. Fast forward to the place and then three weeks later you'll, or two weeks later you'll be able to see the film. What if? Let's dream a minute. Okay? Here's where I am. This is the next minute. What if when the plane lands, information is shared? And that information says what I was doing. And so now I go to my hotel. Okay? And I enable my hotel to actually take the information about where I am. Information goes back. And my hotel tells me, hey, you listen to, we're looking at that film. You want to finish it? Hey, why not? A complete digital, a complete different digital experience. Now, all the bits and pieces exist today. Everything exists. You're just putting them together. So, I've just tried to tease your imagination. I think there's two things that are important in life if you want to, be, if you want to really move forward and get along with the way the world is actually changing. Be curious. Don't stop. Go and dig into things and understand what happens. You don't need the big details, but at least understand what you can get with it. And then be creative. Start pulling unlikely things together. The opportunities are actually endless. You know, our biggest limit today is our imagination. We, we have a tendency, we've sort of been so much boxed in that we have a tendency to always look inside the box. Okay? And we, every time you come up with an ID, you're going to get 27 reasons why this is not going to work. Don't bother about those. Okay. There's a whole bunch of new business models that are actually emerging. People are becoming information providers. People are becoming information transformers, information consumers. We're really getting to that information society that we've actually been talking about. The technology is there. Most of it is there. It's pulling it together, getting the business model set up, delivering the service that really needs to do. And remember, everything we do becomes digital. I really got flabbergasted a couple of years ago when talking to a banker, I realized that 97% of money is bits and bytes on computers. Have no physical evidence. When you buy a share, you just get a bit that is changing on the computer of your bank. That's it. Your photos are digital. Your films are digital. Your, 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 um, your books are digital. Your conversations are digital. Everything is digital. Technology has been creeping into everything that we actually do. Let's now take advantage of it. Let's now explore it. Imagination is more than knowledge, said Einstein. And let me finish off with something. You know, when you think about creativity and imagination, the people I like most are the cartoonists. Because cartoonists have this wonderful capability to pick things together that have no resemblance with each other and come out in one drawing and just bang, pull them together and get a message out. So let me give you one of those examples. You all remember probably that nearly two years ago, unfortunately, Steve Jobs passed away. Some of you may also remember that a little longer ago, actually around, people are not completely agreement, around 1513 BC, Moses 
went to the top of the Sinai and got two stone tablets. What the heck does Moses have to do with Steve Jobs? What do you think? Any ID? Well, at least for one cartoonist, they had a lot to do together. Moses, meet Steve, he's going to upgrade your tablets. That is what I mean. Now, this is done for the purpose of a joke. The same can happen for the purpose of generating a new business, for the purpose of doing something new, for the purpose of helping out humanity, for any other purpose. And I hope that I've sort of scratched and gotten yourselves working a little bit after last night's uh, reception around how technology in general, and cloud in particular, opens up so many new avenues for us to do things that are really exciting. And you know what? I'm looking forward to the future with a lot of excitement because I think there's a lot of great things that are going to happen. And I hope we can all make it better together. Thank you very much. I don't know you, but I definitely, yes. So I'm, I'm going to ask the question in three short, so that the others will listen and perhaps get the answer first. Okay. Now it's going to take time. <laughs> the year 1984. The George, George Orwell. Orwell. Yep. The key word, the brother. Yeah. And the story, Amazon had to pull the book, which it was selling on its Kindle, precisely because they didn't respect the copyright. So you cannot read the book of the Amazon, not because Amazon broke the rules, but take with you the thought always. Wherever there is a right and there is always the other side absolutely the dark side the left. <laughs> thank you <laughs> yep no I, I i agree and i actually alluded to it when i started speaking about uh, privacy and and it, it is a, it's a fine line and but ultimately what will we as citizens accept and what will we not accept? We, are we, we should be, with the prism situation we may not, but we should be the ultimate decision maker of what information we allow to be used and what information we do not allow to be used. That's absolutely correct. But it's, it becomes a, and that's why it's difficult, because if you allow me to use this, this is what I get. If you don't allow me to use this, well, you can't get this. So what's the good and what's the bad of the situations? But you're absolutely right. This is something that we need to be very, very, very careful about. And that probably our younger generations have often a tendency to forget. Uh, when I see some of the statements that are made on Facebook and others, I'm getting a little bit flabbergasted. And I think there is an aspect of education, I would call it digital education, that some of you that are more in the education side of the house may actually have to think about, how do I educate the next generations about the implications of what they do? I remember this lady from the Tea Party a couple of years ago that had to pull back in an election in the US because somebody found back on YouTube a piece of TV where 20 years before she had, when she was 18, pretended 
in a local TV news station that she was a witch. Okay. That followed her 20 years later and made that she could not stay on the election. Okay. We have to think about these sort of things. And I think this is something where there's a whole side put away to the education community to help our youngsters understand what works, what can be done, what makes sense, and what you have to pay attention with. How much of yourself are you prepared to give away? I think that's the issue. Yeah, I was, um, when you were talking about the digital persona, I was kind of thinking, um, it's very impressive that you would go into the appointment and you know all these things about yeah. to me. But um, I was wondering whether there are some limits to that uh, because sooner or later, uh, the people you're meeting will know that you have had the ability oh, yeah. to collect all this information oh, yeah. about them. And they probably have the same ability to collect information. Absolutely. So. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They know. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Things that, if you look at, if you go through your own life, things that you found amazing at one moment in time, that you find perfectly normal. Okay, so this, is, this was just one example of sort of things that you could do. But yes, as life moves on and as, as, as things become more normal, the norm is going to change. So maybe in five years from now, what I just explained to you will absolutely not be flabbergasting to the customer, will be a normal thing. He will actually be angry if you forgot to ask his, his uh, so it can turn back, okay? He will be angry if you forgot to tell him that it was his birthday yesterday, okay? So, yes, that, that's always. But by then, there may be something else that I can't even imagine today. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so things evolve. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Absolutely. Thank you. Oh. One more. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, well, when you were just talking about uh, teaching the next generation of uh, the teaching of the Edge University, uh, okay. uh, next week I'll start a course uh, to uh, tell our students, today we're going to teach us about the new world of working and how uh, ICT uh, changes processes and yeah. the way people work. So, in line with your uh, impressive story. Um, one uh, of the issues we will discuss with the students is the, the process, are, uh, we want them to go faster, the data is getting bigger and bigger, so that we need the computers uh, more and more to work. And of course, for decades before the computer takes over, uh, we, we will all be out, uh, without jobs because the computer takes over. And that didn't happen because new jobs were created, new challenges, new work. But how, what's your opinion about that now? Because uh, big data asks for computers to process. I don't think that it's, uh, well, maybe a threat for people for their future jobs. It depends what they're learning. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you there is, actually I did it with my son, so I, I was going to say if I had a son that was going to university right now, I would, and, and had interest in, in maths and in some of things, I would suggest him to go to applied maths. Actually, I did that with my son uh, about four or five years, uh, about six, seven years ago. I basically suggesting him to go there because that's really an area where we lack resources tremendously. Now, things are changing and the, the jobs that will be needed tomorrow may not be the same jobs that the one that were needed 10 years ago. But I don't see any stop in needing jobs because you're still going to need people to actually think through the programs that the computers will be able to do. With all the intelligence they have, computers do what you tell them to do. Okay? I don't know how often you've heard that, oh, sorry, sir, I can't help you. This is the fault of the computer. Uh, I typically say, no, sir, this is the fault of the guy that actually programmed the computer. So these guys are still going to need them. And so I, the, the, the types of jobs are changing, but jobs are still needed. Also, we are going to expect other types of services than the ones that we've had up till now. So there's plenty of opportunities for people to start up new type of jobs, new type of things. Okay? So if you're more of an entrepreneur type, 
go and start something new. If you're more of a classical type, well, maybe you may want to do applied mathematics or you may want to do something like that to really be at the core of this transformation that is actually up and coming. But at least that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.